Hello there, and welcome to the booth here at Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. That's Randy Bueller. That's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, thanks for joining us. And I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. It's time for the finals. This is what it's all about. One five-game match to decide who gets the trophy, who gets the money, who gets all of the rewards and accolades that come along with being a Pro Tour champion. Let's head down to the feature match. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas and Randy Bueller. It's been a long tournament and it's now time for the finals. We've got our first player here, JC Tao. This is his third Pro Tour of his life. He's in the finals here. He plays for Team East West Bowl and he is on the blue red Eldrazi deck. His opponent, well, this is his third Pro Tour top eight. That is Yvonne Flock. He, was, he played for Team Face-to-Face -face Games here, also on an Eldrazi deck, but on a different flavor. He's on the colorless Eldrazi. And Randy, that, that's kind of the, one of the big questions that we're going to get to answer here is, well, who, who, who broke it more? Yeah, who broke it more? These are the right two decks. These are the right two teams to be in the Pro Tour final. Oh, turn zero gemstone caverns. <laughs> Lucky. Luck. Well, you don't make the finals of the Pro Tour without a few luck counters. <laughs> so when, here's a physical manifestation of that. <laughs> Yeah, one of these teams is, and one of these decks is going to get remembered as having broken it more. I think that's the right way to look at it. All right, so, Luis, you played the deck that Yvonne's on here. Yeah, in fact, against JC. So this is the 75-card mirror uh, or in, on both sides. Like, I just played the even 75 against uh, JC's deck and didn't, didn't go well, though. The, the match was very close. I do think the blue-red deck is slightly ahead. Uh, the card Drowner of Hope is a really big one, and Eldrazi Obligator in a fast game can really seal the deal. Now, what do you make of this opener here, Luis? We've got two lands already in play here for JC Tal, but no play yet. No, he, he's got Reality Smasher is what he's waiting on, and he actually could have played an Endless One as a 3-3, but he chose not to. Okay. And it looks like on draw step here, Yvonne Flock is going to just nab that Eye of Ugin with a Ghost Quarter here in an attempt to stifle J.C. Tao's mana development. If you're not the first person to get out a Reality Smash, is the really big one, the Thought Knot is a big deal too, then using Ghost Quarters makes sense. Uh, that's one of the advantages the Colorless deck has is it does get to, to play Ghost Quarter. Uh, another thing to note is that J.C. doesn't have Urborgs in his deck, so his Eye of Ugin's never naturally tap for black mana. Sometimes he can piggyback off of the Colorless uh, deck's Urborgs, which it's actually a real risk. We considered siding one copy of Urborg out because it's so bad to play Urborg into their Eye of Ugin. They get to untap and... And, and start tapping their, their yeah. land. But, oh, this is actually really big. It might look innocuous, but JC played a second island. That's his last basic. Now he even knows that any further Ghost Quarters are just straight up strip mines. They do run four Ghost Quarter in this list. Yvonne's got four in the main deck here. So, yeah, any, any further Ghost Quartering are going to be very good for him. Though he doesn't have any in his hand. He's got triple reality smasher, a spell scout and a mimic. So, Eye of Ugin uh, was in fact the exiled card off Gemstone Caverns, which makes Ghost Quartering it hmm. even more appealing. Sure. Did you guys consider Gemstone Cavern? We did. That was in one of the lists. Uh, ended up ended up liking what Mutavault offered the deck more. Mutavault was really key in just getting extra damage through, because this is an aggro deck in, in a lot of ways. Sure. The extra damage from Mutavault, sometimes the extra blockers, sometimes the combo with Blink Moth Nexus, since you can pump Mutavault with Nexus. Relatively slow start here for these players is uh, Flock is just going to add a Spell Skite to the board here before he starts smashing realities next turn if he can find another source of mana here. And not much from Tau after that Ghost Quarter in the early stages of the game there. He, he hasn't made a play yet. Well, both players are sitting on Reality Smasher and are one mana away from casting it at this point. Uh, Tau dismember. is just going to go ahead and dismember the spell sky since eventually he's going to have to, and because Gemstone can tap for black, he's able to do that without paying uh, excess life. All right, well, an Endless One finally does hit the battlefield here for Tau. It's just a 4-4. Four four. Um, oh, and it was Ratchet yeah, Bomb Ratchet, off the top. Ratchet Bomb does kill the Endless One. That, that, is, that is relevant, so Even's going to be able to clear the path to hit for two, but he really just wanted to draw a land. If he could play Reality Smasher there, I think the first person on scene is going to have a huge advantage. 
and that was a land off the top of the library there for JC Tau. So reality starts getting smashed. Bam, you're down to 15, Flock, and pass the turn back. Can Flock find a land of his own? No. He can't, but he found a Thought Knot, which is actually pretty good because the Mimic's in play. Thought Knot lets Mimic hit for four. Okay. He gets to steal the... Ooh, well, Drowner. Presumably the Drowner, even though JC can't cast it yet. And then next turn, play if he draws a land, play Smash or attack with two five fives and a 4-4. Four four. It's kind of unfortunate because Endless One coming out as a 5-5 five five is really annoying here. Yvonne could take a gamble here. He could take Endless One and just hope JC misses on lands, but... It's Reality Smasher, not uh, Endless One. Oh, it's even Reality Smasher. So the, it, either way, he could take a gamble and take the 5 drop. Just and, hope he doesn't draw lands. And land hope six. he doesn't draw lands. But yeah. the problem is if that doesn't work out, you're in so much trouble. Okay, in the meantime, the Mimic's going to get in for 4, and Flock's going to pass the turn back. What does Tau find on the top of his library? Looks like he found an Eldrazi <laughs> Sky Spawner. Yeah, the, the, the draft superstar now constructed powerhouse. <laughs> in modern, no less. And, and Tau's got an interesting okay. situation of his own here. Okay. He can play another Reality Smasher and hit Yvonne down to, to five, but he's dead to almost everything. He's actually dead to, even, to end a land because of the two Muta Vaults and just gets attacked back for 10. So that seems a bit aggressive. Attacking with one and leaving one back doesn't sound too bad. Though, he's got to put even on a Reality Smasher in hand, at least one. Even has three cards in hand, hasn't been playing lands. That's the, one of the few cards in his deck he wouldn't be able to cast. If you see JC Tau. He's actually not, JC's not in great shape. If Yvonne draws a land, JC's going to have a lot of problem here because he can leave back both Reality Smashers, but then Yvonne just goes Smasher, 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 just over the next three turns, again, assuming he draws a land. He can attack even down to 10 and then have one 5-5 five five back to block, which lets him trade Reality Smashers and take 9, because the Mimic, remember, becomes a 5-5, five five, right. and go to 1 and be you know, in a situation that's really problematic the next turn. So Thought Not Seer <laughs> was a pretty incredible draw, as it turns out. Yeah, right. that Drowner was JC's plan for not dying to these Reality Smashers. Right. Doesn't have it anymore. Okay, so he is going to smash in there and Big draw even step. the life totals. And if this a, it is oh. a land, he finds Eldrazi Temple. an Eldrazi Temple, which gives him access. Now, this is going to force a chump block here. Well, so Yvonne knows that JC's just got one random card in his hand that he drew off the top of his deck. Okay. And it's a forced play. If he plays Reality Smasher, makes Mimic a 5-5, five, five, attacks with... All, he could actually... Just with he could the actually, two five He could attack even with just the two 5-5s. Five he doesn't mm. have to attack with Thought Not Seer, but he, regardless if he attacks with both 5-5s, five, JC is basically forced to block Reality Smasher, since it's better to block that than Mimic under most circumstances. He can... So... Yvonne's big decision here is whether to put JC down to one or leave him at five and keep a Thought Knot back in case uh, JC has another Reality Smasher. I think Yvonne is dead to Eldrazi Obligator no matter what he does, um, barring not attacking at all, which, especially with the Mimic out, seems pretty unrealistic. But this is an interesting turn. I mean, giving up four points of damage is relevant, but the difference between one and five isn't very big when you, you're doing all your damage in chunks of five. What it really does is it makes something like Mutavolt become lethal. Ivan is unlikely to beat a Drowner of Hope either, but he doesn't know that JC didn't draw a land. Because if, had JC drawn a land, it would behoove him to not play it because that would conceal that he could have a Drowner next turn. So Ivan's mm. got to factor in that it, this, the two draw steps could be land Drowner or Drowner land in that order. Okay, well, he's going to cast a Reality Smasher. This much we do know. The question is, what's attacking here? Well, yeah. JC can't wait to block. I, I kind of like just attacking with the two 5-5s. Five Again, you're dead to Obligator, I think, no matter what. That's uh, fine. You can, you can concede to that card. You're in trouble against Drowner no matter what. But this way, you don't die to a second Reality Smasher, and you presumably have lethal next turn, because JC is at 5, has one blocker, and you have now two 5-5s. Five Though, if JC then leaves Reality Smasher back, you put him to 1. Yeah, this is the more conservative play, and I think you're winning this game by enough that it's a, that I'm okay with it. Okay, so Smashers do trade off, and that is going to half JC Tau's life total down to five, and this is a big draw step for JC. What can he find off the top of the library? It was a Thought Not Seer. Uh, looked like a Vile Aggregate. Oh, sorry, to was me, it but a it could be a Thought Not Seer. You could be right. All right, well, we'll see what he has. Either way, he has to cast it, and this is where not attacking with Thought Not meant that you don't have lethal, but. It does. Oh, it is a thought knot. So that takes one of <laughs> one, one of the, the two, two reality <laughs> smashers. But part of the reason that Yvonne's okay. play last turn was was good is that now two five fives are still coming in, and it's going to prompt trade chump block go to one. And at that point, uh, I don't think JC can win even with. And, and if Yvonne draws a land, he can add a mutavolt to the attack, right? Right, because and he drew Eldrazi Temple last round exactly. 
Okay, so one of the Smashers goes away. JC passes the turn, but Flock has what he needs to win this game in land. his hand. He did find a land. That's a Muta Vault. I think that's game. Yep. Bang. Play this. Activate this. And JC Tao has seen enough. He's going to scoop him up. And Ivan Flock takes game number one of the finals. In impressive fashion there, a nice tight game down the stretch. But Ivan Flock takes it. We'll be back right after these messages. Start on your road to the Pro Tour by playing in a preliminary Pro Tour qualifier. With more than 2,000 locations running events around the world, you're sure to find one near you. Visit magic.wizards.com slash pptq for schedules and information. In the art of Magic the Gathering Zendikar, you can experience the danger and beauty of Zendikar like never before. This lavishly illustrated hardcover book features the award-winning art of Magic the Gathering and gives you an insider's look at the secrets of Zendikar, its peoples, continents, and creatures. On sale now. Welcome back to the Future Match area here in Atlanta. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas and Randy Bueller bringing you coverage of the finals. And uh, Randy, you know, I got to say it here. So one of the good for even Flock. Mm -hmm. And that means he's two games away potentially from winning his second Pro Tour and putting in some pretty elite company. There are only five players that have won two individual Pro Tours. John Finkel, Kai Buda, Brian Kibler, Nikolai Herzog, Tommy Hovey. That's the end of the list. All five of them are in the Hall of Fame. If you want to talk about individual plus team, we could add Gabriel Nassif to that list and Dirk Babarowski to that list. Also, both in the Hall of Fame. These are huge stakes for Ivan Flock. This All is right. yeah, definitely a career-defining opportunity for him. And he's about to hit the ballot. And, you know, third Pro Tour top eight, if he puts a second win up, he's got a world team champ, he's got a Grand P champ, he puts himself right into that conversation. Those are the historical stakes here. Now, the players are moving towards their sideboard plans here. And, uh, Luis, you know, having played the same deck that Yvonne Flock has played, let's take a look at it on the screen here and tell me what you anticipate Yvonne doing here, or, or at least what his approach is going to be. Uh, bring in Oblivion Sower and Gutshot, which is funny. You bring a six drop and a zero drop, you know, to <laughs> got to slow them down and then, and then finish them with the sower. But uh, you basically just want to remove Chalice at all costs, and Ratchet Bomb would be the other card I would expect to see coming out. Now, are we going to see, because one, one thing that we have seen pretty consistently in these Eldrazi, uh, I hesitate to call them mirrors because these decks do play out somewhat differently, but in these uh, you know Eldrazi mirror-ish uh, is Oblivion I, I think, Sower. I think mirror is a fine is term. Is mirror fine? Be, th both decks revolve so much around... Ayabugan, Eldrazi Temple, Reality Smasher, Thought Not Seer, Eldrazi Mimic. Like, those are the key cards. So okay. I think there's a lot of, you know, there are some different, definite differences when you're playing other matchups. When you're playing against each other, the, the important cards, I think, are present in both decks. Okay, so in these mirrors, Oblivion Sower has served a really important role because it seems like it's bigger than most of the things that end up being on the battlefield. You know, you mentioned the Reality Smashers and such. But also, it seems to set you up to start activating Ayabugan. Yeah, it, it's really funny that these decks that can come out of the gate swinging, you know, spending 17 mana by turn three, essentially, uh, off playing these four and five drops for cheap, can also get into a board stall when both players have five, five, six, six endless ones, reality smashers, whatnot, or thought not, actually, because you don't want to lose those in combat. You end up with a bunch of creatures on each side, and then activating Eye of Ugin is what's going to win you the game. Oblivion Sword is huge there because not only does it get you just more lands overall, it can maybe steal opposing Eye of, Eyes of Ugin. All right, let's take a look at what Tao has in the sideboard. You can see there's some, uh, a few more color spells with the Hercules recalls and the stubborn denials here as he, he has access to more mana. But uh, what's his plan going to be, Luis? So we'd assumed that just bringing in Gutshot and Tomb of the Spirit Dragon, but he did play a Ratchet Bomb against me post-board, and actually it sounded like he, he boarded out Endless One in anticipation of, of, to of our deck having more Ratchet Bombs. So that's a little different from what we anticipated, and... Uh, I think Endless One's important enough, I would be tempted to leave it in. Just, it comes down sometimes as a 4-4 four, four on turn 2, sometimes it comes down as a 7-7 seven, seven, or 8-8. Eight, eight. Now that Tomb of the Spirit Dragon, is, is, is that actually going to get activated in a meaningful way, or is it just another land for him? I think it's very relevant, because you know, in any kind of stall or race, you can start getting 3-5 to five life a turn off mm -hmm. of it. it. Makes it really hard to like die to, ink, to Blink Moth Nexus, because one of the paths to victory is just flying over for 2 points turn with Nexus. Tomb does shut that down. All yeah, right. it was pretty relevant against Shuhei. There was a game where he gained life against Shuhei that was relevant to the race, and Shuhei wound up having to use a Ghost Quarter to destroy it. By the way, we, we've got, it's kind of funny for J.C. Tao, because he is very comfortable in this <laughs> matchup at this point. Oh, yeah. This is actually the fourth time in a row he's played this deck. Yeah, he played Shuhei, Shuhei, me, Ivan. Yeah. It's <laughs> crazy. He seems to have figured out the matchup. He, he's 
gotten all the way here, though he does find himself down a game here in the finals with some work to do. But remember, we're now on best of fives here for the whole top eight, so he, he's, got, he's got some wiggle room here. Did you get the chance to test much with Yvonne, Luis? Not a ton, because uh, a, a lot of the face-to-face -face guys, right. and, and some of the CFB guys, but mostly the face-to-face -face guys were in Vancouver, you know, from Canada, and, mm -hmm. and before the Grand Prix, and they're the ones who really came up with the deck. So a lot of us who tested remotely, like, we saw we saw the deck list, yep. and we're like, really? But then <laughs> then we, we started playing it more, and, and it, it looked good. I don't think any of us knew how good it was going to be before the Pro Tour. Maybe some, of, maybe some of the guys who had played it from the beginning thought it was just busted. I know a lot of us were a bit skeptical, I have to admit. Really? Like sitting down for round one, still skeptical? Not, not round one exactly, but what really convinced me was a couple days before the tournament, I was playing the Affinity side, which is supposed to be one of the worst matchups, and I, right. think, I think it is. And I was playing against Andrea Mangucci, uh, along with uh, you know Alex Hayne and PV. Sure. You know, on the Over other side. They were all right. grouped together. <laughs> right. Three-headed giant. And I was playing the Affinity matchup, and I actually just getting destroyed, and I'm just like, all right, you know, this isn't... <laughs> this is this, the bad matchup. Like, I, we played more, and it ends up being, I think, slightly in Affinity's favor still, except... If that's, if that's what you're fearing, I mean, that's just not a bad place to be. How, how late in testing did this deck come about? Uh, Jacob posted a list pretty early on that looked ended up looking fairly different, but it had a lot of the same important parts to it. And uh, it just kept getting refined from there. The deck went through so... so like, they played so many games with it. Uh, it I mean, it, I think it, it is really important to, when you're trying to play an all colorless deck, to really maximize the slots you have because you have access to so few actual castable cards. Mm -hmm. and finding things like Gut Shot was really, really important. All right, so Flock is taking a look at a six card hand. Yeah, he's, he's, he's actually looking six. at the scry. Uh, he's for sure going to keep this hand. Yeah. It's got double Eldrazi Temple and then four Eldrazi. So that's basically what you're looking for. Uh, it looks like just the steam vents to kick things off here for JC Tao before passing the turn back to Flock. Yeah, he's got I and some three drops queued up for next turn. Yeah, currently, JC does not have a third land, so he's not going to be able to cast Thought Not Seer. And he, actually, he could draw Scalding Tarn or Island and, and, or Steam Vents and be unable to cast it even with a third land because he, d he needs to generate the color. Oh, funny. But he's going to be able to run out a couple of Vile Aggregates and an Eldrazi Obligator. You've been impressed with file aggregate from what you've seen? It's looked good, yeah. It, it also looks like it's going to be a pretty important card against, like, Burn, for example. Just a one-mana, <laughs> a one-mana, one-five or two-five is five really toughness. hard for them to deal with. Yeah, the only downside for JC Tao uh, uh, hmm. with that card is that it doesn't match up very well against Reality Smasher. Yvonne went in the tank and came out with a uh, 2-2 two -two Endless one. Okay. And she even reef off the top. Very good draw. It's like basically exactly what JC was looking for because now he can cast Thought Not Seer, which is the card even I'm sure was was hoping to draw. He actually doesn't have that particular little drawsy. Val uh, are going to do a good job of holding off the 2-2 two, two, and now the 3-2 Mattery Shaper here. So, yeah, aggregate looking pretty good. Yeah, it's gonna. It basically serves wall purpose for the first you know, four or five turns, but then once some of the tokens start coming out, the drowners, the the sky spawners, just more creatures, all of a sudden it's attacking as a seven five. And here we go, thought not seer, on turn three here from J C Tao, and he is gonna. He's got to decide whether he wants the sower or the reality smasher. Those are the two options. Worth noting that Yvonne played a second temple here, and, and the land sequencing is really important in this deck because you have, you know, Mutavolt and Blink Moth, which you want to activate and attack with, so you have to play early. But you also, in this case, you want to play Temple Temple. That way, if you untap and draw a third temple or an eye, you can play the Oblivion Sower on turn three. Right, of course. Wow. So JC Tal has to try to figure out now if he thinks this game's going to go for a while longer. And maybe he doesn't. He took the Smasher. Yeah, he wants to make it so Yvonne can't can't have a good play next turn, and Yvonne actually drew one of the, it looks like one of the worst cards in his deck, uh, Urborg, which is oh, a no. really double-edged uh, swamp, as it were, because it, it lets <laughs> JC's Eye of Ugin tap for black mana, which just increases JC's mana by one. It's like a land that when you play it, your opponent gets a land, which is not a very good card. Yeah, now you see the downside here to Eye of Ugin, JC's just drawn a second copy. Yeah, that I it is legendary. That is a drawback. It it's funny that that second copy is likely to be useful this game because at some point Yvonne's likely going to want to ghost quarter once he draws one, and then JC can just play it. Yeah, we saw JC. Uh, we had a quick chat uh, on video about his sideboard plans, and you know he, when he was saying he brings in that Tomb of the Spirit Dragon, that was part of the reason why he said that he felt like 
Well, your team, you know, was pretty proactive about using the ghost quarters. So by aggregate up to a 5-5 five, five now. now. Now it's time for it to come in. I don't hate the double block here because triggering matter reshaper could, sure. could end up being pretty good. And he is going to have to deal with that aggregate at some point. And uh, as we went over in our match, the, the matter reshaper flips, then the ingest happens because one point of trample is coming over. That worked out pretty well for you. Yes, it did. I would have lost that game had it yeah. been the other way around. Oh, he hits a ghost quarter. And then this is going to get exiled. Couldn't, couldn't no, it's just gone. Exiled. <laughs> couldn't quite see what it was. Well, it's exiled. That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> I think Ivan might still be on removed from the game entirely. <laughs> well, Oblivion Slayer does its job here as a 5 8, r regardless, and uh, it's going to be able to eat and hopefully steal at least one. You know, you'd hope for one or two lands. Obviously, one is about uh, 1.6 or something like that is about what the average. Okay. Well, you know, JC had the, the option to take away the Sower, but this is what he signed up for by taking the Reality Smasher, and it looks like he's, Yvonne has hit two lands. So what he's going to want to name there is uh, Eldrazi and Ape. <laughs> I'm not actually joking. The fact that I'm telling this to Marshall in the PT Finals is awesome, but that's actually the <laughs> correct play because you can cast him in Spirit Guide. Because you can <laughs> cast him <laughs> in it, it's, it's the right name. You, you, you can't get mad at me for saying the correct play here. <laughs> I, just, How no, I never get mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> he did name Ape. All right, good. <laughs> now, I'm assuming that, that even really wanted to see an Eye of Ugin Eye of Ugin there. would be his number one hit. He would have loved to see some basics, too. Like, if he saw two islands, it would have been oh. great, too, because then he could ghost quarter and not get, uh, not get JC ha have a, a free land. Yeah, this is going to work out well for JC after having drawn that Eye of Ugin. You mentioned it before, Luis, that, uh, you know, it's not that bad to have an additional one in your hand just because they are so likely to get ghost quartered at some point during the course of the game, and it turns out that's right now. So now JC gets to go transform that into an island and then just play his eye anyway. Oblivion and so are kind of and, and precariously here, holding down the fort here. And here's where I... Th oh, not, oh, not for much longer. Cancel oh, that order. Here's Obligator. How much damage is this? This looks like a lot. That's 20... Looks like 21. 21 damage. Wow. And oh, Yvonne's man. obliged to scoop there. I mean, that's, that, that, that's what Obligator does. Wow. So JC Tao in one big flurry flies in and evens this match at one game apiece. 21 damage in one hit there. Yeah, uh, Eldrazi Obligator being the last spell cast is uh, not an uncommon occurrence. Oof. All right, so we are now tied up at one game apiece, which means we're kind of back to uh, best of three, your, your normal match of magic here. And things starting off back in uh, Yvonne Flock's side here as he's going to be on the play. So one, one of the cards that seems to be kind of the mirror breaker here, and we, we were just talking about it a minute ago, Luis, is Oblivion Sower. This tends to come in out of the sideboard, though I have seen some builds of this deck that have it in the main. Um, what's the decision process there? It's a little slow. We, we almost played one main, or at least some of us did, just because it's one. Of, it's actually for the Obzon deck, because it was the main reason to put it in. We didn't expect tons of Eldrazi, but it turns out the Eldrazi are out in force. Uh, and just a, a long game card that helps you get to Eye of Ugin faster. It was especially good against uh, Frank Lepore's version of the deck. He, you know, he made top eight at, at uh, seventh seed because he had Relic of Progenitus and Scrabbling Claws, which, you know, to enable his own Blight Herders. But I, I, you know, I played against him in the Swiss, and I played an Oblivion Store and got like seven lands off of it because it looks at all exiled lands. And when Relic is exiling Ghost Quarter lands over and over again, you, you get a, a, a lot of extra lands off of that. Yeah, this does seem to be like that natural one step up for this deck if you want to be just a little slower and a little bigger. The Oblivion Sower does a really good job of that. Randy, I, I wanted you to, um, you know, we, we have to realize that not everybody watching this stream has been with us for the weekend. And I want you to set the stage for the top eight as far as what decks made it and what the story is going to be when we look back on this tournament. Yeah, I mean, f coming into this tournament, I think it was an open question in a lot of people's minds whether there really was an Eldrazi deck. 
right? It was only 8% of the field. I mean, it was 8% of the field. It showed up in, I think, bigger numbers than a lot of people were expecting, and it's because you had these two large teams that just flat broke it. So, I mean, when the story of this Pro Tour is remembered, it's very much going to be, here was this new format, here was this new set, here were a couple of bannings, and if your team was capable of finding the right deck, like, you get to go to the top eight. Right? Three members of the Channel Fireball Face to Face Alliance, th uh, two members of the East West Bowl, you know, Frank Lepore working on his own on Magic Online also found a list. A member that, of the that, Secret Affinity team? Yeah, and then you get the Secret <laughs> Affinity team, exactly, two Affinity players. <laughs> I, you don't really see that many Pro Tours that actually just get broken this, this way. Like, when's the last time a Pro Tour format just got absolutely broken in half? Cobblade? I, mean, I, I think it's Cobblade. I don't feel like this has happened since Paris. That's the last time I remember seeing it since I've been actively watching Pro Tour coverage, which started in around 2009. Uh, was was that was kind of the story? And th the really crazy thing too for me is that this happened in Modern, because sure. if you look back at the Pro Tour top eights that were played in Modern, they're remarkably diverse. There's usually seven different archetypes. There's even been eight, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not uncommon to see that. Um, you know, where we come in the booth and we get to kind of say, "Hey, look at all the different decks in the top eight," and this one was so much different than that. The Seldrazi yeah. deck just smashing the field. Yeah, and we could have a conversation about modern and what's going to happen now. I mean, I think a lot of people are interested to figure out, can the metagame re react to this deck? Like, is there a way that the metagame can handle this? And I feel like that's a conversation for next week and, you know, next Grand Prix. And for now, I just want to kind of enjoy watching these guys reap the spoils of all the work that they did, breaking the format in half. Well, I have to point out that, uh, you know, Pro Tour Berlin had six Elves decks in the top eight, mm. but the... Mono Blue Fairies deck, Gabriel Nassif played in that tournament, ended up being the best deck in Extended, and Elves was not dominant in that Extended format. Elves n never got a ban. Wow, that's a great point. And it turned out there was a good foil to that deck that led to a, I think, pretty diverse metagame afterwards. So I'm not saying that the Eldrazi deck is perfectly safe, we should be fine. I'm saying that we should see what happens. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you certainly, there have been plenty of examples historically where a deck was broken for the weekend, but now once the cat was out of the bag and people had the list that they could figure out how to attack, it became possible. Yeah, I mean, having, I hadn't thought of the having analogy, access that's a to, really good one. To, to eight two mana lands I, it makes it a little difficult, but uh, to, to see what exactly is going to go wrong. But I mean, I'm sure there are answers. Both of our players, by the way, are mulliganing to six currently. They not, neither have kept, so. Yeah, you know, can you talk about the comparison between this and Callblade, Luis? Yeah, so because I, that was that was also your team. I, I was lucky enough to be one of the people play, playing Cobblade in that tournament, and it felt like we had broken it. Like it did feel mm -hmm. like we were playing a, a much better deck than the rest of the field. Stoneforge Mystic was just a card on a whole other level. It yep. wasn't, and there was also Chase the Mind Sculptor. So <laughs> that that was that was an enjoyable tournament. We did <laughs> we did very well. This this Does tournament this feel like that. A little different. The win percentage is comparable. In fact, we did better in this tournament. You know the. the the, the combination of our teams did, had put more people with 40% of the top 25, with 10 people in the top 25, <laughs> <laughs> which is... What? Which yes. Is, which is, is kind of absurd. It's kind of absurd. Uh, Half of your combined teams made the top 25. <laughs> it's yeah. insane. Uh, whereas in Paris, we had two in the top eight and five in the top 16, which is also very good. Sure. But I think that this deck is, when it works, it looks way more broken. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the Cobblade had the kind of crushing inevitability of, like, Play a Stone Forge, spell pierce your spell, put a Sword of Feast and Famine in attack, get your card on tap, play Jace. Right, and the plus my Jace, plus my Jace. You know yeah. you're winning that game eventually. Right, this deck, what, when it does its thing, it's more broken. I think the biggest difference is the Cobblade deck had four Preordains, and, you know, mm. Yvonne is, for example, mulliganing to five here. Okay. The you Cobblade lost deck on a mulligan four. But yeah, I, it just it happens. You have these eight cards in your deck, the uh, you know, Eldrazi Temple and Ayavugan, that you really need in your opening hand to be competitive in a really fast game. Cobblade did, didn't really. You could win the games without Stoneforge. You had Mana Leak and Squadron Hawk in your deck, and you had four period in. So it was. It, I think overall Cobblade was more problematic because it just it didn't have any vulnerabilities really. Okay. Little Whereas more consistent. The, the Eldrazi deck is has some consistency issues with its within itself. I mean, even JC's deck has the need for colored mana and colorless mana, and does not have that many sources of either. Like yep. more sources of colored because of Cavernous Souls, but it's still you know you can definitely have problems casting his spells. So I, I would say that Eldrazi long term is less threatening, but in the short term it certainly looks like it's doing more. So this is things. the second best deck you've ever played at a Pro Tour. Yeah, we or, had this discussion does elves, earlier. Does elves make the list? I mean, I, I won a Pro Tour with that Elf deck that was <laughs> insane in Berlin. Yeah, somehow I got to play all these broken decks, which I, is pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you picked the right teammates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas I think 
more people knew about elves. There, there was actually a significant portion of elves in the field. That's part of the reason sure. that six made top eight. Right. Um, my guess is Cobblade was the, the, the one where I felt I had the biggest edge on the field going in, but all three tournaments, it, it felt you know pretty absurd. You, this is part of the reason you play Pro Tours, is to play decks like these on, in, in a, against an unsuspecting field. It's just a very satisfying moment. Oh, yeah. All right, looks like Yvonne's found a keeper here. He's got two lands, including a temple, a pair of reality smashers, and an endless one. So this looks actually pretty good. If he can find another two-mana land, he can start just smashing on turn three. Eldrazi Mimic is the opening play here for JC. Yeah, he found a waste. The second most play played basic in the top eight. Is it really? <laughs> there were seven islands, six wastes, one mountain, and one swamp. That was the, <laughs> the basics in the top eight. <laughs> yeah, this top eight's a little different than your normal. Yeah. It is funny how important waste was to the deck, actually. It gives Just you, having those two It gives copies. you protection from Ghost Quarter and Path Tax, or, or rather get, lets you get something out of those, and it lets you cast spells through Blood Moon. And so despite the plethora wow. of lands that tap for colorless and do cool things, you know, Tectonic Edge, Seagate Wreckage, you know, Rogue's Passage, <laughs> all of these cool, cool lands, we, it ended up being that Waste was the best option for those last two slots. All right, so Flock has the option to Ghost Quarter here, but he decides not to, and instead he's going to play a 3-3 three, three Endless One. Uh, now he finds a dismember off the top. Yeah, Flock's in a tough spot because Ghost Quarter and going down a land when you have Reality Smasher in your hand, especially two copies, is not... It's really tough. Having another land here helps because now he's get, really got the decision because if he draws a two-mana land, he can still cast those Smashers. Having dismember in your hand does help, though, because even if you let JC cast one of his you know, Thought Not Seers or Reality Smashers, you can dismember it. Eldrazi Sky Spawner acting as a, a nice little ramp spell here. Okay, so he's going to get in for three with the uh, Endless One. So assuming JC plays a one mana land next turn, he has access to three, three mana plus the eye, so he can cast anything but Drowner of Hope. I think that drawing the Dismember pushes me towards not wanting to go use Ghost Quarter here. Because you can dismember whatever gets played. You have two Reality Smashers, so even if it's a Thought Not Seer, you'll still have one at least. You can dismember a Reality Smasher, even though it is unpleasant to discard a card to the trigger. And then, uh, as I'm sure you have seen the interaction come up many times over the course of the weekend, you can't turn Real uh, the Eldrazi Mimic into the dismembered creature. Otherwise, you end yeah. up with a, a very small Mimic. Yeah, that popped up a few times here. And yeah, y Yvonne looks like he's decided to take your line here. Luis, he's just passed the turn. It's also a disaster if you go quarter eye and JC just plays another eye. Which, I mean, sure, it can happen, okay. you, you, you're aware of that, but in this situation, that's just really problematic. Yeah, and, you know, Yvonne on the mulligan to five here doesn't have a lot of resources to, to work right. with, and he has to be very careful about all of that. In the meantime, it looks like he's just going to get attacked here. You hear JC kind of teasing <laughs> Yvonne because he's been doing the draw step ghost quarter. Why does he do that? Um, the idea to, to, to be behind that is you hope that JC drew one of his basic lands on his draw step. You don't want to take it out of their deck. You want to give them an opportunity to draw it. You don't want to give them a chance to go to their main phase with eye and play. But I think what JC is saying is that Yvonne is now tanking on whether to use Ghost Quarter yeah. now. <laughs> but he's like, well, you didn't draw step me. If you were going to do it, you would have done it then. Though that does camouflage to some degree that Yvonne has a Dismember, which is another spell he could cast here. Though dismembering one of like the Eldrazi Mimic or Sky Spawner here we could dismember the, the Scion. I mean, I got shot at a Scion, and it seemed like a very reasonable play to, to make because it does prevent something larger from coming down. But Eldrazi Mimic is the biggest long-term threat because it could turn into a 4-4 four, or four, a 5-5. Five, five. Yeah, Flock is going to do that. He's going to go ahead and dismember the Mimic. Pyrexian mana, an integral part of these decks' success, just giving them like a, an all-colorless deck access to creature removal, for example. And JC does not play a land there. Wow, nothing. All right, so this is this is Yvonne's game here, if he can draw a land. Well, Simeon Spirit Guide. He finds the same Spirit. Does that count? Uh, it, it certainly does. He it, can get at least one Reality Smasher down. Oh. It looks like a Dismember followed by a Discard. Yeah, no, no trigger here, JC, but still, this member is going to take down Reality Smasher. Well, there's a trigger of the Reality Smasher. It's, it's, 
it's saying discard a card to me. Or yeah, so I, I think JC was was thinking. That oh, that was a mimic. Uh, that was a <laughs> yeah, mimic, right, yeah. right. He just wanted to make sure he killed it at the right time. But in any case, uh, even Flock gets in for three. You know, JC's running into what I was just saying. He's got red cards in his hand. He can't cast. But it looks like he drew a Thought Knot Seer, which was a great draw because now it takes wow. out the Reality wow. Smasher. Takes out the other one, so even a land off the top here for. And it was the Flock, land. And of course, he drew. He draws a land here. Blank Moth Nexus. Well, this is one of the strengths of the colorless deck. Going, you know, going looking on the other side of the table, Yvonne did draw a land, but he can also use that land to block. I, I love blocking the Thought Knot with the, the three three and the Blink Moth because then you get to get a card off that Thought Knot. Could also, if you wanted, he could trade the Thought Knot for the Eldrazi Sky Spawner. Now is. Um Noticing that JC has missed multiple land drops here, is that tempting Yvonne to use the Ghost Quarter more, or is it making him feel more confident about not using it? I would be more prone to use it. As it turns yep. out, it's not going to work out well for Yvonne here because JC just has another Eye of in his hand, and he, he even chose not to discard it to the Reality Smasher's <laughs> trigger this time. Nice. That is the risk, right, uh, You know that, that Flock has to try to mitigate here. Because, man, it's pretty disastrous if he has another one in his hand, right? You turn it into a mana-producing land and still... Right, you actually netted... <laughs> do you, like, mana gain here. mana, yeah. Y Yvonne not willing make, to Making a good risk. call here, and also the Thought not staying back, respecting the, the, the two lands. JC drew another red card. Wow. So JC needs to draw red mana, and he'll be very far ahead. And Yvonne needs to draw spells. He, Yvonne can cast everything but Oblivion Sower right now. And if he's able to slam, like, a Reality Smasher, then he's in very good shape. He's going to attack for one with So Blake he Mon. must have drawn a, a cheap creature to play here, or another Nexus, because otherwise the Thought Knot would, would, would get to attack. Yep. So a pretty close life total race here, all told. It's 9 to 8. Flock on a mulligan to 5, but mana problems for JC Tau has kind of evened things up. He's got a ton of cards in his hand there. You can see he's got 5. And JC actually drew Reality Smasher and now has an Eldrazi Temple, so you can actually play a Reality Smasher here. And he does, and this could change the race dramatically as he's nearly attacking for lethal here. It's seven. Time I think to trade Nexus for Sky Spawner. Yeah, for sure. If the Nexus wasn't summoning sick, it could block, double lock Reality Smasher and then give, it, give itself plus one plus one, which mm. Yvonne is setting up to do next turn here. Okay, so he's going to go ahead and block. Still takes five and drops down to three, and he needs to find some action now. Oof. Was it an Oblivion Sower? Yeah, and because he had to block with the Nexus, oh. he's, one, he's one mana short of oh. casting it. God, things just not coming together for Flock here. He yeah. finally got to five mana, then he got his Reality Smasher Thought Not seared, and it looks like Flock's just going to pack it in here. Yep. That's JC Tau winning game number two. H had Flock drawn a land instead of a Simeon Spirit Guide, that game would have been much easier. I mean... That's one of the drawbacks of Simeon Spirit Guide is it, that turn it didn't accelerate block because he'd already been missing land drops. And even though it was plus one mana, not having that permanently did come back to bite him. So we're working our way down the stretch of the finals here, and we could have a champion next game. It could be JC Tau. Flock, of course, not going to give up easily, though. And he's going to be looking to win the next game and force a fifth game to see if he can join that elite group of players who have two pro tour wins on their resume. What a crazy Sunday if JC Tao pulls this off. Working his way through two Hall of Famers and Yvonne Flock, working his way, that's 15 Pro Tour top eights he would have to defeat. That's like, that's like getting paired against John Finkel once. Well, well the, the upside for him is that if every time he beats this deck, it be, becomes more and more clear that he's got a, a matchup right. advantage. You know, if, you, if you're going to have a matchup advantage, playing the same matchup three times is pretty awesome for you. Yeah. So let's take a look at uh, an oldie but a goodie here. Let's take a look at Blink Moth Nexus. Uh, you, you were saying that one of the advantages that the colorless deck has is that it does get access to some of these these lands that it can use pretty effectively as attackers and, and even sometimes blockers. Uh, how good is Blink Moth in this deck? Blink Moth is very good in the deck. It's one of the reasons to go colorless because you cut yourself off of playing you know, good colored mana spells like Obligator or File Aggregate, that sort of thing. But the fact that all of your lands can animate and do things is, is very relevant. Nexus gets in for extra points of damage against Affinity, can block their copies of Blink Moth or Ink Moth or Vault Scourge or Signal Plus, that sort of thing. And it, it does actually target Muta Vault with its plus one plus one ability. That is a, a thing that happens. So 
Blink Moth was really important. There was 24 Blink Moths in the top eight because the two Affinity decks uh, were, were also playing. Or maybe, no, 20, sorry, 20 Blink Moths in the top eight, <laughs> which is, that's, that's a lot of Blink Moths. It's <laughs> a lot. Players are getting shuffled up as, again, we work our way down. <laughs> Randy, imagine if we had Mishra's Factory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also want to mention here that we are, uh, we're not in our normal booth. I, I, I found no, you Luis me. kind of wandering <laughs> around by the booth, and I said, hey, we're oh, out that's front, funny. buddy. Uh, we're, we're out in the crowd here, and you can see on, the, on your screen every, all the viewers here. Everybody wave. Hi. There we are. And uh, the early birds up in front there in the couches. Now, that's the place to be right there. Yeah, you see Neil Oliver give the thumbs up. Is there, uh, Who's to say that we're not in a couch not? right here? <laughs> <laughs> And this is fun. We, we get to be out here with the uh, spectators, and uh, it, it lends a different vibe to the broadcast when we get to do this. Of course, on the other side of the, uh, of the curtains there, we've got just one table set up in the feature match area for our two finalists. First order of business here is uh, let's get some keepable hands for these two gentlemen and then uh, do battle. I think it's possible to construct a hand I would keep, you know, on, on either side here that doesn't have Ayabugan or Eldrazi Temple, but the bar is very high. Whereas if you have either of those cards, <laughs> the, the bar gets much, much lower. So you're mulliganing most hands that don't have a two-mana land? Yeah, I would say the vast majority. Like, you know, when I played against JC in game four, no, game five, my first couple hands were uh, four land, matter, re or, uh, matter, matter reshaper, reshaper, endless, endless one, one, dismember. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the none of the lands tap for two mana, so I just basically four threw, land three spell, but not basically good threw two two of those hands away, just because it's hard to get one of the it's hard to get an edge, even on the play when you're not able to play your thought knots and reality smashers a turn or two ahead of curve. Kind of yeah. interesting too, because when you go down a card, if you do find the same hand minus a card but plus a two yeah, mana right. land, it's, it's very like you, similar. It's like you did Mulligan. Yeah. I, I do have to say I love the scry rule, the you know the Vancouver Mulligan, if you will. That, that after you've Mulligan, you get to scry. It, I think it, I think it actually improves the most in limited because I think it makes it reduces the number of games in limited where neither player gets to do or one of the players gets to do nothing. But even constructed, it makes mulliganing a lot less painful. And mulliganing, I think, is a key part of the game. I, I think the mulligan rule makes sense, but it does lead to less interactive games. And I think having the scry rule lets you keep hands that you would otherwise not be able to keep, which can lead to better games overall. And uh, Louis just. Probably means you mulligan <laughs> from seven down to six a little bit more often, right? Yeah, that's the biggest jump, is the, is the, the seven to six jump. You, you mulligan from seven to six more and from six to five less. Yeah. So. And your six-card hands are more likely to be able to interact since you get to scry. Right. Y and you can keep, like, one land hand on the draw in, like, limited, for example, mm -hmm. where normally you would be very hesitant and maybe not do it, but one land with a scry on the draw is all, it's, it's very easy to keep. Actually, getting a bit of the table talk, they're talking about the Eldrazi Obligator play that happened uh, in game four in uh, JC against me. Yeah, he, yeah. he tapped his mana such that he actually couldn't use the threaten ability, but I do want to point out that I was dead even to the obligators at 3-1 haste, so he certainly didn't do it in person. And there's actually a, the, the game result was not impacted by it at all. Well, that's, a, that's a Pro Tour winning hand. That could be the one that takes JC Tao into the champion's ring here as uh, he it's, looks at that opener. He's, he's going to be on the hand draw. And a gemstone caverns. Jeez. Now, how does this one look for Flock? Does he have a keeper? I don't think so. He doesn't. He, he does not meet the criteria no, that you laid he out. He also only has three lands total. He just can't cast any of his spells. This is almost exactly the hand that we were we were discussing. I mean, it has an Oblivion Sower and a oh. Reality Smasher. <laughs> see, so. You see Flock's face. It says it all. Oh. These are supposed to be the good hands in Magic, but yeah, you really need to take advantage of those two mana producing lands, and that's what he's missing JC's here. JC's going to have turn on Vile Aggregate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's going to have three mana spell on turn one of the game. Wow. And then on turn two, if he wants to, he can play both a Sky Spawner and an Obligator. Yeah. <laughs> He'll have nine mana worth of cards out on turn two. <laughs> wow, yeah, this... Yeah, attack for six. We've used the word broken a few times here. Wow, that, that is insane when you put it in those terms. <laughs> Look, I can think of no more appropriate of a place to get a luck counter than in the finals of a PT. <laughs> <laughs> so we find JC Tao up two games to one. 
He's sitting here in his third Pro Tour ever. Now, he's played something like three of the last four. They've yeah. all been recent. And he's up against Ivan Flock, who is now taking a mulligan to six while JC gets to look down at this awesome hand. It, JC also has an Eldrazi Mimic. He gets another two mana spell and to play for free. Oh, my God. <laughs> so he's actually going to spend five mana on the first turn? Yep. Yes. And then he's going to attack for... I mean, th this is what I was talking about. He's going to attack for ten on this turn This makes two. the comparison to Cobblade look like a joke. It just... <laughs> it doesn't do this... Sometimes you're on Ivan's side, right? Ivan is playing a very similar deck, and... He's mulligan, and he's just hoping to be able to cast his spells, because that, that is what, you know, with, with great power <laughs> comes some amount of drawbacks. <laughs> now, now, JC does have to discard one of these cards to the, the gemstone caverns, True. right? He could actually put all seven of these cards on the table on turn two, if it wasn't for that fact. Honestly, I would be tempted to just discard the island. Like, he can cast all his other cards. Yeah, that's That right. might be greedy, but... It means you can't oh play no. two spells yeah. on turn two, but you're this not going to be able to like do that anyway, because you have to discard one of the spells. This one oh, he already easy. mulliganed? He does. already mulliganed. And wow. You know, Flock is somebody who tends to take his time with mulligans, but that was no question. It was a one-lander, and that is tough luck there for Yvonne Flock. So he has an absolute mountain to climb if he's going to even up this match and keep J.C. Tao from the, taking down this piece. You see the smile starting to creep onto J.C.'s face just a little bit. Look, uh, I will admit, when, when your hand is great and your opponent's mulligan into five, you're just thinking, like, uh, we're doing it. We, we've got this. Yes. So, I mean, J.C.'s trying to, Look, you know, he, contain his time. Yeah. Well, he's trying to contain his excitement and not give anything away. Sure. But it's soon going to be revealed when, <laughs> when the luck counter comes out and so do the two other creatures. That's got to be one of the best feelings in Magic. He was the guy that was building this deck, too. I mean, it was him and Ben Whites. Him and Ben Whites put he, in all the time on this deck. He did give credit to Ben Whites for really convincing him to play the deck, though. Okay, I, the way I heard the, the story was the two of them that put all the time in. Right, right. But he said that he, when he was on the fence, Ben Whites just like, I'm locking this deck in. We're going to play it. And, and he and JC just went with that. JC, again, he was on a Team East-West Bowl who put up an absolutely fantastic performance here. 31, 8, and 1, <laughs> with 2 out of 4 in the top 8. And, and coming over from day 1, weren't they like 19 and 1? Yeah, 19 and 1 on day 1. So, All right. I, so I think on 5, you definitely keep this. It's got a Dismember and an Eldrazi Mimic to play. And remember, this is JC says, hold on a second. Does somebody have a dice with a luck counter on it? Jumpstone Cavern. Yeah, what he discards is an interesting decision. What was that? It was an Obligator. The Obligator. Huh. And that's the one he's the furthest away from utilizing, because he he would need another colorless source to to kick it. it. Yeah, but I mean, just three one haste, right? Yeah, I I would be tempted to keep that, but I think that may, he's he's playing it safe this way. Yeah, by, by he keeping had a lot the island, reasonable choices. By keeping the island against an opponent mold of five, you reduce your fail rate, which is really important. I'll buy that. I drew Shiv and Reef off the top, so now he wishes it was the island. But whatever. <laughs> Look God, at this. Here we go. He decides to lead off with the well, Eldrazi Sky Spawner here. Well, they can play aggregate on turn two, and then the Mimic can then attack for four. Right. And if he draws oh. another Eldrazi, uh, realistically, he's going to draw like a, a Reality Smasher and just have a turn two Reality Smasher. <laughs> <laughs> That's you being realistic? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, w once you're in, you might as well just go all the way. Like. That's... That's the idea with this deck, no doubt about it. Three cards left in hand for Tau. Again, he's the one who's up two games to one in this best of five. Yeah. So if he can find a way to finish off, he is going to be our So it's even champion. more difficult for Ivan here because he's got a dismember, but he really doesn't have a good target for it. Like, you can, you can kill either of those creatures or even the Eldrazi Scion, but you're really not getting ahead there. You, I think it's possible that Ivan could just go Ghost Quarter but I think playing the Mimic, I actually like this the most because you're at the point where you're just hoping that JC doesn't play something awesome next turn because you're going to have so much trouble beating it. Off the top, and there it is. Jeez. Vile, aggregate, trigger. It's a four, five. So it's going to become a 4-5. Four, four, five. Five. And there's not much that Flock can do here as he's tapped out. Looking to take seven damage here. The the, the only like silver lining for Flock in this particular situation is that JC has drawn two in a row, Jushiv and Reef Steam Vents, and has Island in hand. So JC doesn't have another spell. I, I like the product of blocking the, <laughs> the Eldrazi Scion there. At least he gets some value out of it. As Yvonne doesn't know that JC does have more, more lands in hand, but mm -hmm. this was one of the ways to try to steal a win. 
Simeon Spirit Guide off the top there for Flock. No, not a terrible draw. You know, if Flock's able to dismember Vile Aggregate, he goes to 12. He takes four off the Sky, sky Spawner Mimic, though he could actually even block with Nexus. Whoa. If JC just draws like three lane in a row, we actually have a game here. That was another Sky Spawner off the top of the deck there for Tau. All right, that's not bad, but... That does make the Vile Aggregate that much bigger, but it's still just going to die to yep, dismember still here. still dies to dismember. JC Tau sends in the team here, looking to close out this game and win a Pro Tour. Blank Moth, active, block. Dismember your Vile Aggregate. Take four. These make the trade, and Flock's going to fall down to 10 life after the Eldrazi Mimic hits him for two. And it's just another land for Tau. But it's a land off the top for Flock, too. If that was a two-mana land, he had a Simeon Spirit Guide, he could play Reality Smasher. Unfortunately, he does not have that. He has nothing, so Tau still needs to find action. What did he find? Look like a Thought Not Seer. That's an I saw, too. That, I think mm. that's, not Seer that's going to be tough to come back from. do it here. He reveals his hand of Reality Smasher and Simeon Spirit Guide. Smasher gets exiled. He's going to trigger the Mimic. Four, five, six, seven. That's going to prompt a block. He's going to take five. This could be it. And that's it. JC Tao is our champion. He wins. Blue Red Eldrazi are the winners here at Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. Yvonne Flock is going to have to settle for a second place finish. Fantastic stuff down in the feature match area. Really tough beat there for, for Yvonne. You know, it's, it's not the way you want to go out with the big mulligan. You know, you, you had that earlier <laughs> I, I today as well. I can attest to that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually the first match of Constructed Yvonne has lost with that deck. That's the uh, he first was undefeated match on, on the weekend, weekend until there. JC Tao, congratulations Win, for the to you. for the 12th time with his deck. There you go, buddy. You can let the big smiles fly now. He is our champion, JC Tao. Congratulations to him. And what a story here from Atlanta, the Eldrazi reign supreme. And uh, we knew from the moment the final started that that was going to be the case. So the only question was, which one? And it was blue, red Eldrazi in the hands of JC that takes the thing down. All right, for all of the reactions and news, let's send it to, to Rich Hagen at the news desk. Marshall, Luis, and Randy, thank you so much for the call there on the final of Pro Tour Oath, Oath of the Gatewatch. Rich with Ian Duke from Inside R&D and the Pro Tour historian Brian David Marshall. Uh, guys, for every winner, there is a loser. And there was a beautiful moment there at the end where JC, in his moment of triumph, just that little wry smile at even flock. I know what it's like to lose. It's not fun. Thanks for being part of my amazing Pro Tour moment. I thought that was a really lovely gesture. Mm -hmm. a, a, a rare, you know, you don't always get to see that moment of humility uh, in the face of victory, right? It's usually, you know, you have that exuberant jumping up and down, but, but JC, I think, respected the gauntlet that he had to run through this bracket. Right. Yes, I mean, that, that was a sort of virtual handshake for six-time Pro Tour top eight competitor Shuhei Nakamura, six-time Pro Tour com uh, Top eight, his, his bracket in the top eight was a Finkel's worth of Pro Tour top eights. Right, six, right. six, three. So, I mean, that, that, is, that is, you know, an impressive run on, on the part of JC Tao. Um, just can't say enough about him. Ian, uh, we know that inside R&D, uh, you play the Future Future League, which is for That's standard, right. and, yep. you, and you look at the new cards that you've made, and you try to break them. You break, try to break them every day to see, are they pushed too far? Where, where do they go? Talk about just how hard it is, as someone who is building decks all the time internally, to come up with a deck in a format that has 50 sets in it. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, <laughs> we get a lot of questions about how much do you test for modern versus standard, mm -hmm. that, and obviously most of our testing is for standard. Mm -hmm. um, we do think a lot about modern as well. But um, when you're testing a format, the larger the format becomes, it's not like simply, imagine we're testing a format twice as big as standard, right? It's not that there's twice as many decks, there's far more than twice as many decks, right? Just the way different cards combine. So when you're talking about going from, say, a six set standard to a 50 set modern, just the number of possibilities are astronomical. And so it's really, really impressive to see these teams just go deep into the tank, do a lot of creative deck building, and ultimately get rewarding. I mean, that's one of the most fun things about Magic is 
figuring out your own deck, figuring out how, how to break things, and ultimately getting rewarded for it. And that's what we saw here today. Right. And Brian David Marshall, uh, lost in the shuffle because we have only one winner by definition, is that there were two teams that delivered that astonishing performance. Not just East West Bowl with the eventual winner, JC Tao, but also uh, the combination of Channel Fireball and Face to Face. This has been the best Channel Fireball performance ever? It may be the best team performance ever that we've seen at a Pro Tour. Uh, 20 players from Team Channel Fireball and Team Face to Face Games, they worked together, they came up with the same deck, I believe 17 of them mm -hmm. played this Eldrazi deck, and 10 players, 10 of them, in the top 25. That is just absolutely outstanding. Three of them in the top eight alone. Uh, you know, one player in the finals, one player in the semifinals, <laughs> one player fell by the wayside in the quarterfinals. Yeah, and if Magic was just a game of luck and variance, if you had a team of 20 in a field of 400, well, you do the math, you would basically look somewhere between one and two of you would be in the top 25. They put 10 in the top 25. It, a truly astonishing deck building performance. We, we just saw that there is luck in Magic though. Luck counters. That's right. <laughs> literal luck counters. Well, literal <laughs> luck counter. I've been waiting to see a luck counter at the Pro Tour since that card was printed. Uh, and you know, we get we get it here uh, in the finals. It was so amazing. All right, well, let's take you back to the start of the day then. Let's show you the bracket. If you're just joining us, this is how the day has panned out for us. We began with Shuhei Nakamura in his six Pro Tour top eights, colorless Eldrazi against Jashen Tao of the United States. And blue, red Eldrazi got the job done. Tao advanced to the semi-finals. Who would he face there? Well, it was either Luis Scott Vargas with Colorless Eldrazi or Pascal Menard with Affinity. Ian, what's your sense of how Affinity did this weekend? We knew it had a big target on it coming in. It was probably the default deck that everyone knew was coming. In the end, it was Luis who won uh, three to two uh, in that one. But what, what was your take on Affinity this weekend? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it was the deck with the target on its head this weekend. Uh, it's been one of the most powerful decks since Modern's Inception, even before that. Uh, and it's called the best game one deck um, in the format, of course. I thought it was a great choice for this weekend. Um, Luis talked about it a little bit in the booth. He actually thought that Affinity was the weakest matchup for the Eldrazi deck, of course. Um, you know, still still anyone's game as far as things went. But um, yeah, I mean, I thought overall it was a good choice for the weekend. We saw it win once in the top eight and we saw it lose, yeah. but um, yeah. All fine. Let's go into the bottom half of the bracket. Andrew Brown was against uh, Patrick Dickman of Germany. This was the other Affinity list. And although Affinity lost with Pascal Menard, it won with Patrick Dickman. Dickman advanced to the semifinals. And there he would face either the colorless Eldrazi, even flocked the third deck, uh, tied with Shuhei Nakamura and Luis Scott Vargas. 75 cards, exactly the same. Or Frank Lepore with processor Eldrazi BDM. A word for Frank Lepore. Flock won that one in the end by three to two. The odd game in five, but an amazing first Pro Tour for yeah, Frank Lepore. Absolutely. I think uh, there's a lot, a lot of players at home who could take a lot of inspiration from Frank Lepore, someone who's been you know, writing about the game, uh, creating content about the game. You know, he's done some coverage at events in the past right. uh, and has been around the game for the better part of a decade in a, in a visible way, but um, had never played on the Pro Tour before. I, you know, and it, it can be difficult to qualify for a Pro Tour while you're doing other things, you know, yeah. creating content about the Pro Tour. But, you know, had, had qualified for the Pro Tour, had, had an invitation for this event, and comes here, you know, and again, you know, we've talked so much about the Super Teams, but working in a, in a fairly small, uh, on a very small team, uh, was able to uh, come up with his, his own take on the Eldrazi deck, was able to 6-0 draft and make his first top eight in his first Pro Tour uh, mm -hmm. appearance. So in the semifinals, we had Luis Scott Vargas against Jeshen Tao, and that went the way of the Blue Red Eldrazi deck. In the second semifinal, we saw Patrick Dickman against Stephen Flock. Flock won that one, and so Jeshen Tao had to go up against Colorless Eldrazi for a third time, and he got the job done. The champion of Pro Tour Oath of the Gay Witch is Jeshen Tao of the United States, and right now it's time for the award ceremony for Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. Hello and welcome to the feature match here in Atlanta for Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. It's been a fun and exciting trip for all of our players and everybody here on the coverage team for the course of the weekend. Now, 
we finally found a champion here in Atlanta. Before that, though, I want to take a moment to recognize our finalist, Yvonne Flock. Fantastic job, Yvonne. I know everybody's proud of you for your awesome finish at the tournament. It is now time for us to recognize our champion, JC Tao. Come over here, JC. I have a couple questions for you. Congratulations. First off, let me shake your hand. You did a great job. You can kind of peel over here. There you go. So we got a chance to watch on your last game that opening hand, which looked pretty darn good. And then Flock, unfortunately, had to mulligan down to five. What was going through your head as you were sitting there staring at that sweet hand? Um, how to not throw the game away. <laughs> so you were just thinking of, let's make sure that I execute on this awesome hand and, and get this thing done. Yes. Now, how are you feeling right now? Are you, you, you look a little like, come on, I want you to like scream out loud or jumping down or something. Are you okay? I'm not sure how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming for you? Yeah. Okay. Well, we know that a big part of putting together a run like this is your team. So why don't we bring out your team, East West Bull, here to help you celebrate and show you how to do it right, JC. JC, congratulations once again. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, your champion, J.C. Tao. Outstanding stuff. And there you see the champion of Pro Tour, Oath the Gay Watch, JC Tao of the United States. But gentlemen, for all it's one individual with the trophy, and it's only his bank account that'll look $40,000 the richer, what we saw at the end there with the best part of 20 people around him, this Pro Tour victory belongs every bit as much to all of them because we don't know who was there on Tuesday night, the week before last, where they go, I don't know, I think maybe the third one of this in the sideboard would be better. Or, you know, I really think people are gonna play Affinity. And it's the little mm. moments over dinner, in the back of a cab while you're think on the way back going, I wanna shave a land here or there. And that's where Pro Tours, because the margins are so small, BDM. Uh, absolutely, and you know what? Even at that, on that stage, where JC hadn't quite sorted through his emotional state about what had happened, his team was there to show that excitement and that energy for him. Yeah, you know, no. I mean, and, and, and to really go, oh my God, you did it. And the thing is, it can be overwhelming, Ian, because you, you've sat and watched so many dramatic moments, um, sometimes when you're invested as well um, in the outcome. And, you know, we've got our champion coming in. Brian David Marshall's got the trophy. That's a first. We don't have coasters for the new news desk yet, so I had to set it up here. <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome to the news desk, the champion of the Pro Tour. JC. Great job. So, JC, we were just talking about the team that were around you, and a lot of people at home won't really know a lot about your team because you're not the Pantheon, not yet, not no. Channel Fireball, not yet, but you've done something extraordinary as a group. Tell us about your team. Um, where to start? Uh, this team, actually Ben White, he invited me to this team when, we, when he knew I was qualified for this Pro Tour. Up until that point, I had been thinking of testing on my own. Uh, so it was very lucky that he dragged me into this group of friends. Um, and there's no way I could have done this without any of their help, without everyone on the team's help. Um, they've just been so supportive. Even though when we first came out with the deck, it looked like a pile of junk. Um, <laughs> They, they listened to us and play tested the games with us and offered us ideas on how to improve this yeah. uh, to where it is now. I, I, I want to ask you about that because 
any time, we, we all dream, it's the, it's the great dream that we're in a room and inspiration strikes and we go, hey, you know what's going to win a modern Pro Tour? Eldrazi, Skyspawner and Vile Aggregate. Yeah. And everyone looks at each other and goes, yeah, that's the answer. But that doesn't happen. No. How did you go through convincing people and having that trust in each other because pro tour invites don't come around very often and you're putting that uh, all on the line for this incredible deck i made ben play games with me until he was convinced <laughs> so, and i wasn't even convinced myself at how good the deck is but i needed him to say yes this is a legitimate deck and at that point we started working on it full time I, w I want to ask you about uh, at what point during the tournament, because you were out in front through, throughout this event, you, you were coasting. <laughs> at what point did it begin to maybe sneak into your mind that, wow, this could be an event where I've really put it all together. I have the deck, I have the team. At what point do you start letting the thought of holding that trophy and getting that check creep into your mind? Never. Never, not even in the finals? No. <laughs> So what, what, what do you do to keep yourself calm and to keep yourself focused through, through with such high stakes? I, I just try not to think about it too much. <laughs> well, you know, something you, you have to think about now is you've just earned yourself a seat. You know, not only are you the Pro Tour champion, are you platinum for this year and next season beyond that? Mm -hmm. You're going to be going to the World Championship. Uh, yes. Uh, but not very far, though, because you're <laughs> from Seattle, right? That is convenient. Yeah, so if we're, I, I believe that may well be where we end up. So uh, we'll, we'll be seeing you just down the road. Seattle's a great city to host it in. Certainly is, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. So apart from your team, is there anyone that you'd like to uh, thank while we have this opportunity? Because everyone's magic journey is different, but it isn't just about the last two weeks. I know it can't be, you know, I still remember the very first person who said, this is an island and this is what it does for you. You know, so tell us a little bit about your magic journey from first magic to first Pro Tour title. Um, well, I started playing magic when I was very young, um, back in fifth edition. Uh, this was back when I was in middle school. We had no idea what was going on. Dragons <laughs> were awesome, angels were great. <laughs> Uh, and then I quit when I started college. Uh, and it took my friend Eugene, Eugene Huang, ah. to really, uh, we were playing, we started going back to FNM drafts together and uh, during college days. And after, after that, we just never stopped playing Magic. So he was uh, always playing games with me and always a great friend to just uh, go to the tournaments together, play games together. And he's someone who's had some success at the Grand Prix level. Did you, oh, uh, yeah. did you uh, get confidence watching him succeed that you could uh, follow suit? Um, he definitely inspired a drive in me, but uh, I'm not, I, I never imagined I would be here today. Well, you don't have to imagine because now you are here. That is your trophy, an amazing performance by you, an amazing performance by Team East West Bowl, phenomenal, and an amazing performance by the Eldrazi. Maybe Grand Prix Bologna, Detroit, and Melbourne will have something to say about that in a few weeks' time. But from all the team here at Wizards of the Coast, at Pro Toro for the Gatewatch here in Atlanta, Georgia, to all of you, play hard, play fair, and we'll see you next time on the Magic the Gathering Pro Tour.